So first I want to thank the research committee and Joanne in particular for inviting me to be part of this panel. So as mentioned, I'm really going to try to set things up for the other two panel members who are really the experts when it comes to natural environment as well as disaster emergency management. So I'm sort of setting the background. I'm going to have a little bit of an ethical critique as well of BP. So I've entitled this BP, British Petroleum Beyond Petroleum or Bottom Line Profits Only. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> so a preliminary ethical analysis. So in terms of what I'll do, I'm going to start out, I'm actually going to give you an exam question that I actually had for my students and see what you would think. So we'll start with an exam question on BP. Then I'll look at the history of BP because in my opinion, to really understand what happened in the oil spill in 2010, you need to sort of look at the history of BP, a little bit of a timeline. Were there, for example, problems prior to 2010? Then I'll engage in my preliminary ethical analysis. A little bit on corporate social responsibility as well. Just a few lessons for the Canadian oil producers. I'll leave most of that to my two colleagues. And then finally, a conclusion. So I'm going to start then with an exam question. So imagine this is your exam question now. As CEO of a marketing firm, you can assume it's, let's say, a public firm, would you accept BP, t BP today as a highly lucrative client if you did not believe that they sincerely wanted to change their practices, but were merely engaging you as part of a public relations exercise. So based on your knowledge of BP and the incident and so on at this point, and let's say your public firm, your CEO, let's say, of that public firm, that marketing firm, would you take them on as a client under these circumstances? How many would say, yeah, makes sense to me. I mean, I'm here to make money, right? I'm CEO, I'm a public firm. How many would say, yep, take them on as a client. I'll work with them. This is a good thing. Only one? That's it? Maybe two? <laughs> Maybe three? How many? No, I don't like this. Motive intention is important, in other words, and there has to be sincere motives to actually want to change before you would actually take on a client, even though you are a marketer. So again, this gets into all sorts of different issues, but sort of hits on the point. You know, BP actually is, I believe, producing videos and they're working in terms of public relations and they are hiring a number of consultants as most firms do when they get through a crisis and the question is so is that acceptable if you really don't think they're going to change and then that gets into the history because has BP really changed I mean haven't they faced something like this before haven't they had many opportunities to change why isn't it happening so let's go back to 1995 we have John Brown he becomes the chief executive originally it's called British Petroleum and during his tenure, 2001, he renames the company BP, and the tagline is Beyond Petroleum. So what does that suggest? When you hear Beyond Petroleum? Renewables. Renewable, sustainable, ethical. Sounds nice. You like that? A little bit better? Beyond Petroleum instead of British Petroleum. And they also have that beautiful Sunburst logo as well. So that's 1995. Everything's looking good. And in fact, by 2003, at least on paper, one could argue they're looking like a pretty sustainable ethical firm. What are they doing? They've invested four billion dollars in alternative energy. They've implemented operating management systems to reduce safety risks. They have a code of conduct. They have a director of business ethics. They have global ethics seminars. They ban political contributions, which was quite unusual and still today, really for any firm, especially an oil firm. They ban facilitation payments, which are legal under the law, yet not permitted. And then they've established an ethics committee as well, which reports directly to the board. So on paper, looking good? You like this, the green sunburst logo and beyond petroleum? You might invest in the firm, you might want to work for the firm. And not only that, let's take a, a little snapshot of a speech given by Stuart Broom. So he's the uh, director of business ethics. So he says, at BP, we have chosen to put ethics high on our agenda. It's not because we have more ethical problems than most large companies. It's not because we're unusually high-minded. Rather, it's because we think it's the right place to be for our employees around the world, our partners, industry, communities, our reputation and performance today and for our future tomorrow. A little prophetic there in terms of what might end up happening. So on paper, looking good, you would not expect then problems in terms of ethical problems, let's say, from this firm. Well, very quickly in 2004, we have an incident in Texas City. There's an, ex there's an accident. Two workers are killed, one injured. BP is fined $109,000. And one can argue cost-benefit analysis, not that significant. You know, yes, two workers die. You may have to deal with lawsuits, but you know, not a major fine. Does it really encourage you to make any changes at that point? 
2005, a year later, so again, Texas City refinery, and this time, much more significant. 15 workers are killed, injures more than 170. Now the fine is a little more significant at $21 million for safety violations. They also have an incident, this is July 2005, so there's Hurricane Dennis, and you can see the platform there, it came very close to sinking. And what's significant about this, if it had sunk, it actually would have been a worse oil spill than the current spill in the Gulf. So fortunately it didn't happen, but nonetheless there were concerns that they didn't construct it properly. Maybe some negligence in terms of the construction of that platform. But there's more, 2006, oil spill in Alaska, there's a rupture in a BP-owned pipeline, largest spill ever on the North Slope, 200,000 gallons, so pristine tundra basically covered in oil. And you have a union rep at that point saying, for years, we've been warning the company about cutting back on maintenance. We know that this could have been prevented. So you're starting to get a picture that there's a history here and there are concerns that they're not spending enough on safety. Now we have a new leader comes in, Tony Hayward, in 2007, and the former chief executive, John Brown, resigns in a personal scandal. I didn't actually determine what that scandal was, but nonetheless. So Tony Hayward comes in, everything's looking good. You know, so Turn the firm around once again. But what happens, 2007, you've got manipulation of the propane market. They're, they agree to pay $303 million to settle charges. So again, ethical, you know, it's not just oil spills, it's other improper activity. And you have October 2009, another problem at Texas City. So here's an $87 million fine for 79 new safety violations. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, a $3 million fine for 62 safety violations at an Ohio refinery. And then finally, we have the major incident that we're focusing on today, the Deepwater Horizon. So everyone remembers this explosion, 11 people, 11 workers, most of them actually Transocean employees, so they were killed. And there wasn't an oil spill immediately, although all of a sudden they realized, yes, there's an oil spill, there's a leak, and then you have the over 200 million gallons ultimately leaked, and it took a while to reach the shore, but uh, it took three months to actually cap this thing. And everyone probably remembers the images of this thing is on fire, and so on. So that's the major incident, but you would think, okay, now there won't be another incident, right? I mean, now they're gonna clamp down. But guess what, there was another one. Shortly after, a month later, Alaska pipeline, there's a leak, 5,000 barrels of oil. So it wasn't even just what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Still takes place May 2010. Now in terms of the causes, and my colleagues might talk about it a little bit more, but it's a little bit complicated. And when you sort of read through all the commission's reports and so on, it's a little unclear in terms of who necessarily was responsible for what reasons. But in general, I think it's safe to say that there was a rushing of the process you have problems with Halliburton, the subcontractor that was responsible for cementing the well, that that wasn't done properly. BP's apparent failure to center the well properly. BP's decision to use seawater, this is very important. They could have used mud, so it would have been heavy drilling mud, but instead they used the less expensive seawater, and as a result, the methane gas gets through the pipe and ultimately leads to the explosion. You also have other problems with not using enough plugs. Uh, the failure by BP and Transocean to pay close attention to pressure tests, so all sorts of other reasons ultimately causing this. You also have the question of inadequate training and supervision of key personnel, a lack of focus on safety, and now the most recent White House Presidential Oil Spill National Commission report, which basically gives you the bottom line. This was an avoidable accident and it was caused by a series of failures and blunders by the companies involved, and that included not just BP, but Transocean, the owner of the rig, Halliburton, and then also the government. So there's also some blame put on the US government. The regulators didn't do their job properly as well. And this is just two months ago this report came out. Now let's look at this, the leadership of the firm. May 31st, Tony Hayward says, I'd like my life back. This is one month after the tragedy. Good move, you like this? Your BP shareholder, this is what you want to see from your CEO. He needs his life back. You know, he's not being paid enough and you know, he's under too much stress. Now, he did apologize on Facebook the next day and says, you know, when I read it, I was appalled. I apologize. So he was moving towards the direction of, look, okay, you know, maybe that was an insensitive comment. But what happens a month later? Do you remember this? How many remember this when he went yachting shortly afterwards? So he has a, a yacht in a, in a race and he goes yachting. And this is only two days after 
he angered lawmakers in Washington because he refused to provide details during his testimony. So again, if you're the public relations firm for BP, you would say, not a good move, again. In his defense, a BP spokesman said, it was the first break Hayward had had since the explosion. I mean, you know, obviously when you're CEO, you're under a lot of stress. This is a crisis you have to get through. I mean, he deserves to go yachting, right? Again, you know, not a good move, at least in terms of public perception. So that's a little bit of the background and the storyline that kind of leads to the explosion. So now I'm going to move and briefly talk about the ethics of what took place. So I'm going to start with a critique, and there are a series of moral standards that I'm going to suggest <coughs> indicate this was highly problematic. And then I'm going to move to support. And for me, this is always maybe the most interesting part of an, an ethical analysis, is understanding, is there actually an ethical justification for, in this case, BP's activity prior to the oil spill? And there is. There are three moral standards, egoism, relativism, utilitarianism, upon which you can argue this was ethically justified. And for me, that might be the link for many firms and their executives that creates sort of an ethical justification, an ethical rationalization. Why is it okay to take these chances? So that'll be the other part of the analysis. We'll start then with the critique. So trustworthiness, in my opinion, is a core universal ethical value. It's made up of several other components, other values like integrity, promise keeping, honesty. And for me, integrity is the biggest problem for BP. And you've already seen it now with the timeline. They say they stand for one thing, but they aren't living up to it. And whenever a firm says they stand for something, well, guess what? You're going to be judged at a higher standard. In this case, this comes directly from BP's value statement, both before and still today. Uh, you can find it on their website. We are committed to the safety and development of our people and the communities and societies in which we operate. We aim for no accidents, no harm to people, and no damage to the environment. You accept that? Has that been the case? You know, can you criticize the company? So in terms of integrity, they certainly aren't living up to that. In terms of responsibility, so what does responsibility mean? It Me means be accountable, fix the problem, don't blame others, apologize, compensate. So has BP lived up to that core ethical value? Well, what was the first thing that you started to see after the spill? Did BP accept responsibility? Were they fully accountable right from the beginning? Or who did they blame? The subcontractors, you know, obviously it's their fault. Um, the subcontractors would actually blame BP or the US government. But you'll see here, so we have BP CEO Tony Hayward saying, look, the rig that exploded on April 20th and then sank was run by another company, Transocean. That rig was run by their people, their processes. And this is always a big problem for companies, even Toyota, for example, when they had their problems, who do they blame initially? You know, the people that made the brakes, right? It's not us. Uh, Ford Firestone, if you remember that a number of years ago, Ford blames Firestone. It's their tires that are blowing out. So this is a big problem for companies taking responsibility. And not only that, there are stories of BP and the subcontractors forcing the workers to sign immediately waivers of legal liability. Literally, after they get, they're getting off the rig, it's exploded, they're getting off the rig to safety, sign the waiver. You're not going to sue us. And that's now going through the court system. However, in their defense, BP did set up a $20 billion compensation fund. I think $5 billion so far has been paid out. So in their defense, you can argue at least on the compensate side of responsibility, they did go in that direction. Caring, in other words, avoid unnecessary harm. Every firm, whatever they're producing, will cause harm of some degree. The question is avoiding unnecessary harm, avoiding the avoidable incidents. And here, you know, the question is, were they making enough money to, to afford, to be able to afford additional safety measures? Absolutely. Now this, I don't know if anyone saw it, Anderson Cooper 360, he had an interview with the rig workers, and if you haven't seen it, I recommend you, you see it. And basically they're saying, look, we understood that if we raise safety concerns, we, that we were supposedly able to raise safety concerns, we could stop all the processes. However, what's the reality? What happens to you later on? You're fired. You know, people were fired. And this I discovered, there actually was a survey about a month before the oil explosion, the explosion, that basically about 50% of the workforce actually said, we fear reprisals if we raise concerns about safety. So in terms of caring, avoiding unnecessary harm, certainly not happening. Citizenship, in other words, protecting the environment and the communities. Here, clearly, you look at the whole story, that the record, we're not protecting the environment both before, during, and you can argue even afterwards in terms of the cleanup process really could have done more 
and a little bit faster as well. Kant, those familiar with Emmanuel Kant or Kant, so he's all about motive. You have to act according to one's moral duty. It's based on a principle, he says, it's called the categorical imperative. It's really basically like the golden rule. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. How would you feel? Also reversibility. And the idea here, you know, if you were a BP executive and you put yourself in the worker's shoes, the fisherman, the citizen of the Gulf Coast, obviously you would not want this to happen. Additional safety measures being taken. Respect seems like they're treating their employees as merely a means to an end. So a violation of Kant. Moral rights, very clear in terms of health, safety, natural environment. All of these moral rights were being infringed through the actions of BP. Although one can argue shareholders also have moral rights. It's the right to property that tends to come into conflict with companies when they're deciding how much money to spend to prevent possible tragedies, accidents. Ethical egoism. And some people, philosophers, will say this is not a moral standard. I believe it is a moral standard. Uh, it's a question of when it moves to greed, that's when it becomes a problem as opposed to just self-interest. But if you take a look at the record, it seems like overall BP is focused on cutting costs and saving money and therefore enhancing their bottom line. They were uh, losing 1.5 million per day if they would be behind schedule. And there's this idea of paying for peril, a rationalization process. And Tom Donaldson and Professor Warden suggest that this also helps explain the financial crisis. That all of a sudden, if you can deflect all the risk onto someone else's shoulders, or the governments, or the world, you know, there's moral hazard, you're willing to take greater chances. And that probably happened for many bank executives, and it probably happened also for many BP executives. <clears throat> now I should point out that in terms of the report, uh, there wasn't a single instance where a, single, where a human being made a conscious decision to favor dollars over safety. So we do have to qualify our, our critique of BP, but nonetheless, in the end, in the most recent Presidential Commission report says they were interested in cutting costs and the bottom line. So ethical egoism in that sense, they lived up to. They were acting as you would want them to in terms of maximizing long-term profits based on the risk factor. Relativism is another powerful moral standard. What does the majority of a particular group, in this case the industry, think is acceptable? And here you have this culture of complacency within the entire industry that may have contributed to BP's decision making. All oil companies engage in equally risky activities and this idea of normalization of questionable behavior, similar to the financial crisis, if everyone is acting a certain way, even if it's a low, lower standard than it should be, it becomes the norm and that has probably happened in the oil industry as well. Okay, in terms of utilitarianism, so utilitarianism goes beyond ethical egoism. It's not just the self-interest of the firm, it's of everyone who's affected, the greatest net good. And here, in terms of oil, and we see this even in today's papers with what's going on in Libya and the Middle East, there's a real strong argument to say, look, oil is still the least expensive way to run our plants and everything else, our economy, and as well as security, especially in the U.S., and therefore, on that basis, we need to be doing offshore drilling. We need to harvest our own oil reserves. Major benefits to all the major stakeholder groups. There are potential costs, but it totally depends on your risk probability. And that's really the most critical determination. So there are risks to workers, fishermen, citizens, animal life shareholders. But you know what? When you factor in all the backup systems, the blowout preventer, all of the extra safety systems that supposedly were in place and supposed to be working, you would say a very low likelihood of a tragedy. And on that basis, under utilitarianism, would say, you know what, it is for the greatest net good that we have offshore drilling and take the chances that we took even on the platform. So overall moral judgment based on application of the moral standards, other than ethical egoism, relativism, possibly utilitarianism, it's very difficult to justify the activity, the risk-taking activity of BP, even if they were in compliance with the law at the time. <clears throat> very quickly on Milton Friedman, so he's very famous for corporate social responsibility, that the business of business is business, and he does have some constraints. You still have to follow the law, ethical custom, avoid deception and fraud. So what would his assessment be of BP prior to the oil spill, he might say, you know what, this is socially responsible. You're maximizing long-term profit, you're obeying the law, at least the intention was that they were obeying the law, abiding by the industry norm, ethical custom. They were, one can argue, trying to avoid deception, although that's debatable. 
However, any other broader CSR approach like stakeholders, looking at all the stakeholders, would reject the actions of BP. So when is broader CSR necessarily required? In my opinion, if you are working in an industry which has the potential for a catastrophic disaster, you necessarily have greater CSR obligations, ethical obligations. And these are just some examples of industries, chemical, toy, food, pharmaceutical, nuclear, airline. There could be major tragedies. Guess what? You have to be at the highest possible standard, period. Or you do not engage in the business activity. And we don't have to go too far back to look at Union Carbide and Bhopal India, Exxon Valdez, Nestle selling its infant formula, maybe two million babies dying ultimately as a result. There are major risks and therefore you have to have additional safety. As well, this danger of being too big to fail. Everyone's heard that expression now after the financial crisis. To me, that's another highly problematic factor. BP maybe was too big to fail. Too many pensioners in, in Britain relied on their share value. And as a result, you can have decisions being made, also part of moral hazard, you deflect the risk and greater risk is taken. So ethical crisis management, for me in terms of Prevention, the danger, as I mentioned, is relying on particular moral standards that will rationalize unethical decision making. The response has to be based, in my opinion, on responsibility, the core value of responsibility. So full accountability, as I said before, fix it, admit fault, don't blame others, apologize, compensate. And finally, turn the crisis into an opportunity. And the firms that get through, like Johnson & Johnson with Tylenol years ago, the firms that get through the crises best is the one that actually says from the beginning, we're gonna be the leader in our industry when this is over. And there are examples, so Exxon, after the Valdez, actually did become a leader, one can argue in safety. Shell, Union Carbide, which was taken over by Dow Chemical. All of these firms, one can argue, started to set the highest possible safety standards after the crisis took place. Now this actually was two days ago, or is it two days ago, we March 10th? Often the response to a tragedy defines the character of an organization. So this is the new BPCO. I, I am determined that we will emerge from this accident as a company that is safer, stronger, more sustainable, more trusted in its time, more valuable. This is, so this is Bob Dudley. And just to mention, the Exxon CEO just yesterday said, no, 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 no. Don't tell us this is an industry problem. This is a BP problem. So you can see the quote there, breakdown of management oversight. It rests with one company just BP. So he was actually critical of the industry doing more. Lessons for Canadian oil producers. So I take the position that an ethical corporate culture that has safety first is critical. So encourage reporting of safety concerns. Protect those who do blow the whistle. Importance of ethical leadership didn't seem to exist throughout BP. The need to infuse the core ethical values throughout the policies, procedures, and practices. So when you're hiring, promoting, firing, compensating all your employees and executives. It has to be tied to safety, for example. Must make clear ethics take priority to the bottom line, especially when they're in apparent conflict. You have to walk the talk, go beyond the law when it comes to safety. And final recommendations. So in general, what would I say? You need to have government oversight, very strict government oversight, but also effective industry self-regulation as well as at the firm level. Rigorous international safety standards and auditing practices taking place. And then as well, God forbid there is a tragedy, firms have to establish up front that they can cover and afford to take care of people who might need to be compensated or all the damage that might result. And it really should be one firm that takes on that primary responsibility. Part of the problem is that you have all these subcontractors with different responsibilities. Who is the lead in this case? Can you ultimately blame each other or not? So that was a fairly quick overview of BP. And with that, I want to thank you all very much and turn it over to my colleagues.